chapter five is the start of really some in the important part of sanitation when it comes to how we can prevent people from becoming sick. And that is the flow of food, how we monitor the food from the time it comes into our facility till the time it comes out to the diner's plate. That is when we have the most control over what happens to that food. Um, before that, you know, we have some precautions, which we'll talk about, but it's something that it's outside of our control to an extent. But from the time that we receive the food to the time that it goes for our customer to eat, that's when we have the most control, especially over those two big parts of fat, Tom, temperature and time, and how we can make sure that the food that we are serving to our customer is going to be safe. So chapter five is a, bro a brief introduction to the flow of food from uh, receiving to service. <clears throat> so um, for this chapter, we're going to talk about ways to prevent that cross-contamination. We're going to talk about ways of preventing time temperature abuse. We're going to talk about different temperature measuring devices and what they're good for and what they're not good for. We're going to talk about how to calibrate a thermometer and general guidelines for thermometer use because the thermometer is going to be one of your best weapons that you have to help prevent foodborne illness. So what is the flow of food? So the flow of food is the path that the food takes through your operation. As I said earlier, it's from when you purchase and receive it all the way till when it goes out to the customer for them to eat. And the ways that we can prevent and keep people safe um, through that flow of food is twofold. First is we need to make sure we're preventing cross-contamination from happening. And then second, we need to prevent time temperature abuse. If we can control both of those, we have a pretty good assurance that the food that we are serving to our customer is going to not only be delicious, but also going to be safe. So, you know, we've talked about cross-contamination in past chapters, but we're really going to hit home because that's a big thing that one of the two big things, of course, that I see uh, when it comes to working in the kitchen is not thinking about timing, thinking about what you should do first, second, third, et cetera. And if you're not thinking about that, chances are you're not necessarily thinking about issues as far as cross-contamination. So things that you can do to prevent cross-contamination. Um, first and foremost, if you have the ability to use separate equipment for raw and ready to eat foods. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the things, if you notice in the picture there, they're cutting that chicken on that yellow cutting board. They actually make cutting boards uh, color coded. So you know which ones to use. So the yellow there would be identified for poultry. So you'd put poultry and stuff on it. Red uh, is usually identified for like meats, green for vegetables. Um, so you can do different color codes to make sure that you're only cutting, in this case, poultry on those yellow cutting boards. Now, that's not always feasible. Um, if that's not feasible, that's okay. You then go to that next step to prevent cross-contamination. We need to make sure we are thoroughly cleaning and sanitizing. And that includes all work surfaces that we're gonna be working on, the equipment that we use that's gonna come in contact with food, and then utensils. Um, that's going to come in contact with food. Anything that's going to come in contact with food, we need to make sure that we are cleaning and sanitizing. Um, so, you know, for example, it says in the book, you know, after you've cut up raw chicken, you can't just rinse the cutting board with water. You need to make sure that you are washing rinsing and sanitizing, especially because by doing that, that is what's killing that potential pathogen that's on the cutting board from that chicken. So it does not mosey its way on over to whatever else you might be cutting as well. So if you do separate equipment and you're only doing that stuff, that doesn't negate, by the way, clean and sanitizing. Just because you're using um, a yellow cutting board for chicken or poultry doesn't mean you don't have to wash, rinse, and sanitize. You still have to wash, rinse, and sanitize. You can't just wipe it down and call it a day, you know. Um, but by only putting poultry on there, you lessen the risk of cross-contamination from happening. 
But no matter what, you still need to make sure you are thoroughly cleaning and sanitizing. Um, another thing you can do to prevent uh, cross-contamination is prepping raw and ready to eat foods at different times. Um, so be thinking about how you uh, are prepping things. So if possible, prep your ready to eat foods first, then your raw foods. When you get into the kitchen um, here at ICC and you come in to start working on labs and finals and stuff, those are things you want to be thinking about. You know, okay, I need to prep these carrots and celery and stuff and do all that cutting. Then let me break down the chicken because then I minimize the risk of cross-contamination happening because I've got raw chicken on the cutting board. If it's the last thing that I prep on my cutting board, um, the chance of cross-contamination is gonna be very low. Okay? Um, but you wanna try to make sure you're not mixing uh, raw products and ready to eat foods on your tables at the same time, if at all possible. Uh, of course, when you're done prepping those items, make sure that they make it back in the refrigerator and stuff as well, especially anything that is considered a TCS food. Um, if it's a TCS food or ready to eat food, we want to make sure we are using time and temperature uh, to our advantage, again, to minimize those risks. Just don't set the cut up chicken on your table and let it sit there for a couple hours while you're prep working on other things. Get it back into the refrigerator so you can help prevent bacteria growth so it doesn't go from lag phase to log phase. You can also um, buy prepared foods, um, foods that don't require much prepping or handling. Now that doesn't mean it's 100% safe because you know you, you hear it all the time, recalls of different foods, um, things like that. You know, it can still happen at the processing plants as well. But if you're buying prepared foods, then you are you know, minimizing that risk of cross-contamination that's potentially happening in your facility. Now, this is outside the scope of this class, but something to think about, though, um, especially in the future, that if you are buying prepared foods like this shredded iceberg lettuce that it has here, that increases your food costs because it's going to cost you more to buy that lettuce already prepared than it is to buy heads of lettuce and preparing it yourself. So it does increase your food costs when you're buying prepaid pre prepared items. Um, but so then you need to make sure you're de decreasing your labor costs. I digress on that. That's for a different class. But of course, I just always like to throw those little nuggets of information in there for you to be thinking about, especially for the future. Time temperature control. So uh, remember that if we are holding food between 41 and 135, we um, are holding it in the temperature danger zone. Okay? If we uh, keep that in that temperature danger zone for too long, we are doing time temperature abuse. Because remember, that's the range where bacteria grows the fastest. All right? And especially within the range of in our kitchens. You know, especially if you have it sitting out in our kitchen, you know, it's, you know, depending on the time of the year, anywhere between what, 70 and 100 degrees um, type of thing. Well, that's like prime bacteria growth. So if you're holding TCS foods in that temperature danger zone for extended periods, then you are doing time temperature abuse to that food because you're just telling the bacteria, hey, if you're there, might as well grow. So remember, trying to keep them out of that uh, temperature danger zone. So food is being temperature abused whenever it's handled in these ways. It's cooked to the wrong internal temperature. All okay? right. If you're cooking it to the wrong internal temperature, again, ideally above that 135. Um, I obviously there are exceptions to that. Like if you're having a, a rare medium rare steak, um, it can go under that, but um, those are going initially out. They're not being held or anything. Um, another big thing is if it's being held at the wrong temperature. Once you've got it cooked, you want to make sure if you're going to hold it, it holds above 135. If you are refrigerating it, you need to make sure that the internal temperature of that product is 41 or below. You get above that, now you're in the temperature danger zone and at your, it's subject to time temperature abuse. So uh, be careful about um, products. So good rule of thumb, especially when it comes to TCS foods. Keep hot food hot, keep cold food cold, okay? Minimize the time that's in that temperature danger zone, that 41 to 135. We wanna in and out as fast as we possibly can, okay? The other side to it is if we cook or reheat incorrectly. 
reheats a big one. Um, like I've seen so many times that people take cooked food or they take like a canned cheese sauce or something like that. And they put it in a crock pot and, you know, they take those number, big number 10 cans and put it in the crock pot and then they put it on high and then they think that's going to reheat. You know, a crock pot is not meant for rapid reheating. Crock pots were invented for us to do low and slow over eight hours. So to bring up that cheese sauce in this example to 165 degrees is going to take longer than the time that we have allotted to get it through that temperature danger zone. Um, and I see it happen all the time with people that are doing fundraisers and things and they don't have the professional background. They don't have this training. They think, oh, I can just put it in a crock pot. It's going to be fine. No, that's not the case. It's not going to heat it fast enough. You need to get it through that temperature danger zone as fast as possible, but definitely within two hours at the max. Um, that then um, is, makes the product potentially subject to that time temperature abuse. So again, things that we need to be taking in consideration, thinking about when it comes to where those TCS foods are in relation to that temperature danger zone. <clears throat> So ways the, for time and temperature control, um, first and foremost, we monitor the time and temperature. Don't guess. That's why you have a thermometer. Well, you should have a thermometer at least, right? So monitor the temperatures, monitor the time that's in those temperature danger zones, whether it's because of cooking, whether it's because of cooling, um, holding, whatever the case may be, making sure that they are in the proper temperature ranges. Um, make sure that the correct kinds of thermometers are available. There are different types we'll talk about make sure you have those available to use for the different things that you might need done. Uh, regularly record temperatures and the times they are taken. Um, this paperwork is essential for uh, things we're gonna talk about down the road called like HACCP um, and it's record keeping. And it's that, like I've talked in the past, it's the being proactive to minimize the issues that may occur. And so a regular record keeping is something that is a part of that. Um, and you've already heard me say it multiple times. I'll say it again, minimize the time that food spends in the temperature danger zone. And if stuff, if the standards are not met for time temperatures, take corrective actions. Right? And those corrective actions can be a lot of different things depending on where you're at in that situation. So we have a couple different types of thermometers that you can uh, utilize. The old school is the bimetallic stem thermometers. And um, these are still being used. You don't see them as much. A lot of people are going now for the electronic ones as opposed to the old school ones, but you do, do see them used. And I want you to be familiar with them because it might come into a play where you have them at your facility. So with these bimetallic stemmed uh, thermometers, they actually measure through the metallic stem there. And the sensing area is from the tip to that dimple. And you can hopefully see that there on the right hand side. Um, you can see where the dimple is at. It's in that area. That's where it's being um, the sensor is actually happening. So that's how it gets to the temperature. Now, a nice thing about uh, these style thermometers is most of them have a calibration nut to help keep that thermometer accurate um, because these do have a tendency to um, not be as accurate, especially after a long, long time use. If you drop it, if you do really hot or really cold, it's a good idea to uh, make sure you're calibrating them to make sure they're at the correct temperatures for when you're measuring. So, um, and that's the thing is ignorance is no excuse as far as from the health department's perspective. So if you're using these thermometers and you, they haven't been calibrated and your temperatures are not matching up with what the health department is, and then they go and uh, look at calibrating your um, thermometer and they find that yours has not been calibrated, guess what? They're not going to go, oops, sorry, it's honest mistake. They're going to go, you should know this. You know, this is what you're being trained. You have this uh, certification, you know, you have this training. There is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse for that. And you shouldn't, it shouldn't be an ignorance for it because you are learning about it. It is something that's part of it. So please, please, please um, be familiar with those. Um, now, the other side to it and what you see a lot of um, chefs using nowadays are either thermocouplers or uh, thermosistors. 
and they work similar to each other. Um, the only difference is the electronics inside and how it does um, its measuring. Those are slightly different, but they work in the same way. So they measure also typically through a metal probe and they usually display their temperature digitally as opposed to the um, stem thermometers. Um, nice thing with these is typically the sensor is on the tip of the probe. And so you don't have to stick the thermometer all the way in. Uh, you can just take it to where it needs to go in order to uh, for it to read the temperature. A lot of times they'll come with interchangeable probes. So you'll have uh, like an immersion uh, probe, which is good for uh, like liquids and stuff. So if you're frying something, you want to make sure you have it. Um, you know, similar like you would find like a candy thermometer type of thing, an immersion style probe. Uh, surface probes are usually for on uh, cooking equipment. They usually don't put those on top of your product because you want to know the internal temperature. Penetration probes, of course, those are for your internal temperatures. And then you even have air probes, uh, which are used to uh, monitor the temperature within your coolers and stuff. Again, going digital um, as opposed to the old school style when it comes to air probes. They also have laser or infrared thermometers. Um, these uh, very quickly measure the surface temperature of food, um, but just on the surface, it doesn't do anything internally. What's kind of nice about these, if you really just need to do a quick, like you're doing um, inventory, uh, bringing product in or receiving product, and you want to make sure your food is being held at you know right temperature, um, you can do that to get a really quick reading as far as what the product surface temperature is. Um, but you have to understand, it's definitely not gonna be as accurate as something that you can actually insert into the product itself. Sorry, I went a little too far there. Um, you then also have some other recording devices, um, maximum registering uh, thermometers, um, this will indicate the highest uh, temperature that's reached during use. So if you can't continuously observe it, those are kind of nice, but it lets you know that, hey, this is what uh, it got up to at one point or another. If you're doing long cooks, uh, especially long cooks at different uh, temperature settings, uh, like smoking, things like that, uh, that one is kind of nice. Uh, when you're working on that is also good as far as through uh, your dish machines and stuff as well. Uh, time temperature indicators, these both monitor, as it says, time and temperature, and those are typically uh, attached to your supplier packaging. Uh, what's nice about those is um, if your product is being shipped and it gets out of the temperature range that it should be in, there's a color code change that lets you know that and it cannot be altered. So let's say that TTI is for a freezer product. It gets put on the packaging. If during the transport, uh, it ends up going above freezer temperature, um, it will actually indicate and it will let you know for how long was it above that temperature. Um, so it's a real quick thing to see if you are going to accept that product or you're going to reject it and send it back. Um, so that was not something you necessarily use here in the kitchen, but something that you see a lot of times by the suppliers to make sure that that part of the supply chain is being kept at the proper temperature uh, before it gets to your door. Um, so calibration is adjusting the thermometer to make sure you're getting the correct reading. And there are two basic methods. The two methods are the ice point method and the boiling point method. And you can probably guess with, with the names, those are based upon uh, some temperature, I won't say absolutes, but some uh, pretty strong temperatures that you can work on one way or the other. Boiling point method, this is the secondary way. It's not my favorite way um, to do it. But again, if you're doing it, you bring tap water to a boil. Then once it's up to a rolling boil, you put your thermometer in, it should read 212 degrees. If it does not, you use that calibration nut and you adjust it so it reaches um, 212 degrees. But also note that that number might not be exactly the same um, because it depends on your elevation. So um, boiling point of water, uh, and this is according to the book on page 5.8, um, is about one degree Fahrenheit lower for every 550 feet above sea level. So if we're 550 feet above sea level, 
our boiling point is going to be actually 211 degrees, not 212. So you can see it, it, it's a little tougher um, because you have to know what your elevation is um, as opposed to sea level so you can make adjustments that way. But it is one method that you can calibrate. The best way I think if you're calibrating is the ice point method. And that is you fill a container with ice. Um, and ideally, if you have crushed ice or shaved ice, that's better because you want to get as cold as fast as you can. Um, and then you add cold water to it, uh, mix it around so that water gets very, very cold, then submerge the sensor into the ice water, um, wait till it stops, so about 30 seconds, so it actually stops moving. And then you adjust it to make sure it reads 32. Fahrenheit because 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point of water. So if you've got enough of the ice and the water in there, it's going to drop that water temperature to just at that freezing point because you've got the ice that's frozen and then you've got the water that's not, but it's cooling it down. So it's almost at that freezing point. So that's to me more the more accurate way of uh, calibrating a thermometer is using that ice point method. And it's also you don't have to worry about steam burns or anything like that. So some general guidelines for thermometers, um, make sure no matter what thermometer you're using that you're wash, rinsing, sanitizing, and air drying thermometers um, when using them. Don't forget also to wash, rinse, and sanitize the cover or the case that it's in. Uh, if it, Again, if it's coming in contact with the stem, making sure that is being clean and sanitized as well. Um, make sure you calibrate your thermometers if they've been bumped or dropped um, after they've been exposed to extreme temperatures. Um, it's also nice to make sure they're calibrated before your deliveries, if you're using those, and even before each shift, just to make sure that you are ready to go. So just some good rules of thumb when it comes to what makes the most sense uh, for calibrating and making sure your thermometers are ready to go. Um, make sure they're accurate. Um, if you use a check food, they must be accurate to two degrees plus or minus Fahrenheit. Uh, if you're checking air temperature, they must be accurate to plus or minus three degrees Fahrenheit. Um, only use glass thermometers if they are enclosed in a shatterproof casing that, you know, like candy thermometers, old school or sometimes glass based. We want to make sure they're in a shatterproof casing because the last thing we want to have happen is that glass shatter and get into the food. Now there's physical contamination. So we got to get rid of the product. Um, you always want to insert the thermometer into the thickest part of the food. Um, if you, in, put it in the thinnest part of the food, that's gonna read, oh yeah, it's at the temperature you want, but the thicker part is probably not necessarily at that temperature. So you always wanna make sure you're sticking it into that thickest part of the food to make sure you're getting a best accurate reading. Um, make sure you take more than one reading in different spots, because again, you might find that it might be done here, but it's not done in another spot, especially when you're getting into things like poultry and everything that are very, very particular as far as its temperatures and stuff. And you want to make sure you're waiting for the thermometer reading to steady out. If you're using that stem thermometer, making sure the dial stops moving. If you're using the digital, making sure the digital is not changing its numbers. It's at where you need it to be. Um, as I said, chapter five is that, you know, overall, here's what we're looking at. Things you'd be considering and taking in consideration. Uh, thermometers, of course, making sure you have them, you know how to use them, you can calibrate them. Uh, being aware of potential issues as far as cross-contamination and time temperature abuse. We'll get more into details in the following chapters, but this just gives you a good overview of things we're going to be looking at when it comes to our food from the time it comes in our door to the time it goes out to our customer.